Hi everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. Today my guest is Dr. Robert Boyd from, the, uh, from Arizona State University. He is professor of the School of Human Evolution and Social Change there, and is also the author of several books, including How Humans Evolved, Culture and the Evolution Process, and Not by Genes Alone, Dr. Boyd, thank you for coming on the podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Okay, perfect. So, uh, for the people who, who will be watching this, could you please give us a brief account of what is dual inheritance theory, sorry, dual inheritance theory, or gene culture coevolution, as it's also known? Yeah, for sure. Um, so uh, most organisms have um, uh, they have basically two ways of adapting to their environments. Uh, the first is natural selection, shifts their genes, gene frequencies, genetic composition of the population, and then there's various mechanisms of uh, phenotypic plasticity that allow them to adapt you know, within their lifetimes to local environmental circumstances. Um, humans have uh, a third mechanism, um, which is we're much better at learning from each other than other organisms, and this means that human populations carry a pool of information through time, and uh, dual inheritance theory is an attempt to account for how that affects um, human evolution, basically to amend standard Darwinian theory to account for the fact that humans have this second mechanism of inheriting information about um, past events. Uh, now it's true that other organisms have, there is various forms of culture in other organisms, but humans are the only population that seems to be able to accumulate information gradually over many generations. Um, there may be a couple of small exceptions to that, but, but uh, humans are by far uh, more reliant on that than any other organism. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Uh, so um, yes, sorry? Yeah, no, I was just going to... Was that enough or did you... Uh, enough or did you uh, how are you doing? Uh, yes, 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 the, the, that was the, a good answer. So, uh, and now another question. So, in your work, you talk a lot about how we should look at the period in which our species evolved, that is the Pleistocene, in the way that it had a lot of uh, environmental, a lot of climate fluctuations. And so, um, if, you if we take that into account, uh, and we, if we only think about natural or sexual, uh, sexual selection, to think about how humans would have adapted to these climate fluctuations, that it wouldn't have been quick enough for, for uh, woman, uh, humans to adapt to a novelty of problems that were appearing all the time. And so, uh, in way, culture, would have been a good explanation because it would allow for a rapid, a quicker accumulation of better strategies to deal with novel problems, right? Right, so the, the, the last few hundred thousand years has seen, uh, especially during the glacial periods, uh, both an increase in the short time scale fluctuations, time scale fluctuations on less than a thousand year time scales, and an increase in the amplitude of the fluctuations. So when I teach my students about this, I use a North American example, but a European example might be uh, a population is living in, uh, in Lisbon now, and a thousand years from now it's living in the north part of Finland or something like that, and then a thousand years later it's back in, in, uh, in uh, you know, southern Iberia. And uh, so these are huge fluctuations that human populations had to keep up with. And uh, although genetic change can sometimes be fast, uh, probably not fast enough uh, to deal with time, uh, big fluctuations on those timescales. So this creates a new environment 
at least as far back as we can see in the climatic record, which would favor, would favor a cultural mode of adaptation. Mm -hmm, exactly. And uh, could we think of human culture as being the result of our, our common innate psychological mechanisms, the mechanisms that are shared by all humans in the world, uh, how they process different inputs coming from different environments, and so they would give different outputs, or do we need uh, other do we need to add other things to the picture to better understand how human culture developed? Well, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, the reason that humans have this ability and other organisms like, say, chimpanzees don't, that's certainly due to organic adaptations that have, have occurred in the human lineage since the split with the common ancestor of chimps and humans. Um, however, I don't think it's true that cultural evolution is completely... So I think um, some of the things that underpin cultural evolution are culturally evolved. So genetic evolution created a psychology that allows us to, to do this, but then on top of that there are, um, are culturally evolved things. So um, just to take a present-day example, um, uh, written language is a culturally evolved um, uh, artifact. It depends on organic stuff in the brain, uh, we know that, but the, that stuff didn't evolve for the purpose of allowing us to read, it for other purposes. So, for example, there's a, a spot on the lower part of the brain here on the left-hand side that uh, is uh, crucial for recognizing letters, at least in people that use alphabetic scripts. And uh, if you have a stroke that damages that part of your brain, you can't read letters anymore. But, but we know for sure that that didn't evolve for the purpose of, of reading, because reading is only a few thousand years old. So. Uh, uh, that shows how cultural evolution can take brain structures that were evolved for other purposes and create novel um, psychological processes. Reading is completely automatic. You know, you drive down the street, you see a sign. You can't avoid the information coming into your brain. It seems like a module, but, but it's a culturally evolved module, and it has big effects on future, on downstream cultural evolution. So once people evolve, evolve writing, that has all kinds of knock-on effects on how cultural evolution proceeds. So I think it's a mixture of, of, of genetically evolved psychological machinery, some of it evolved for the purpose of cultural transmission, and then cultural evolution taking, taking over that and uh, modifying it for various cultural evolutionary purposes. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, and uh, another, but another but aspect. Weird Sorry. Sorry, I was just uh, Skype is weird because there's a weird lag between when I stop talking and then you answer me answer the question. So I'm trying to get used to that. Oh, okay, okay. No we must be on a satellite or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah no, no problem. Don't worry about it. Um, okay, so yeah. but another aspect of human culture and of culture cultural evolution is that it can also produce, particularly through some mechanisms, maladaptations, right? So, for example, uh, yes. to, uh, to biases, to psychological biases that uh, that woman uh, we uh, women's have is that uh, is the frequency dependent bias that is the uh, humans have the tendency to imitate what is most common in a given society and also the prestige bias that yes. is to imitate the successful people but yeah. if all people or the successful ones are acting in ways that are maladaptive then that could lead to yes. maladaptations in, in general right right so i think that it's um that uh, the only requirement is that 
for to understand the genetic evolution of the machinery is that uh, is that on average cultural evolution is adapted so uh, prestige bias and conformist bias I think the evidence is they're on average they're adaptive processes they get us useful information about environments but um, on occasion fairly frequently they lead to rather odd outcomes um, and uh, you can see prestige bias leading to all kinds of crazy behavior I, I spent my younger days as a rock climber in Yosemite Valley and there's a very definite prestige system amongst the climbers there and it leads to completely nutty behavior including on my part but but uh, you know so there it, it kind of runs away and uh, um, uh, but I don't think that's a paradox. It's 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 like many forms of learning. You have a mechanism that is good on average, but it can you know there's no requirement that evolution produces things that are good for every single behavior. You can't consider behavior evolution behavior evolution behavior by behavior. You have to get at the at the underlying mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And uh, could you please talk a little bit about the importance of imitation versus learning in cultural evolution and also the concepts, if you could please explain them, of guided variation versus biased transmission? Sure. Um, I, so the word imitation and the word learning or social learning uh, it's kind of a, a messy topic. So lots of psychologists use the words in different ways, and uh, um, so I don't get too hung up on on the words, what we call things. What what does seem to be true is that um, being able to learn uh, by listening to or watching or, or interacting with another person involves an inferential process. So you observe somebody doing something, or um, and you have to infer what it is that um, is in their minds that gave rise to that behavior. So if somebody uh, is speaking Portuguese and there's a grammatical system behind Portuguese, and uh, when kids learn that, they have to infer the rules. Nobody tells them the rules. I mean, maybe later in school they do, but but. Kids are completely fluent before anybody tells them anything, and uh, um, and so whether that's imitation or learning, I I don't know. Different people use the words in different ways. I don't worry too much about that, uh, but I do think it's important to, try to understand the cognitive mechanisms uh, that that make possible this inference and how different traits or how this stream of of complex behavior we see is parsed into into pieces and how we incorporate those different pieces, those are all difficult and I think poorly understood uh, problems. Uh, I'm not a cognitive scientist. Um, I try to interact with cognitive scientists. Uh, and I don't think, I mean, they're working on these problems, but I don't think we understand completely. I mean, language learning is a great example. There's immense controversy about exactly how it is that kids um, learn the rules of grammar and, and syntax and so on. Uh, uh, the, se the, the second half of the question was about bias and guided variation. Um, so uh, now this, so guided variation occurs when somebody modifies their behavior based on individual learning, and so without interacting with other people necessarily, and then transfers behavior to um, to subsequent generations. So that's a kind of change process. That's, so it's important to distinguish between change processes that are based on selection, in which the, the variation in the population is somehow culled. So do you know the word culled? Uh, in English, when you're picking vegetables or things like that, you cull, take only the good ones and throw the bad ones away. That's what natural selection does. And that's what bias transmission does. You, you, people observe other people, other behaviors, and they pick some and not others. And that means that the, the, the change in the population depends on the amount of variation that's in the population. Whereas guided variation 
can um, can occur um, uh, even if everybody in the population is exactly the same. So, um, uh, I mean, this is a sort of hypothetical example, but it'll illustrate the idea. Um, before World War II, Japan was a highly militarized society. And after World War II, J Japan's become a very uh, pacific uh, society, very anti-war, uh, peaceful society. And on the account of one book I read, uh, uh, basically Japanese people learned that, that war was a really bad idea because you know the horrible things that happened to them. It wasn't that there were some people who thought it was a good idea and some people thought it was a bad idea, and, and the people who thought it was a good idea were more likely to be imitated. Although that might be part of it, but but a lot of the change was just to do the fact that everybody learned the same thing, and then they transmitted that to their kids. That's kind of variation. Um, uh, bias transmission. I mean, the simplest kinds are ones in which some new idea gets invented. Um, so uh, I've done some work in the Pacific uh, and. Um, uh, cassava, which is a, a, a New World root crop, was introduced to the Pacific uh, uh, when Europeans reached the Pacific. And so now farmers could choose between growing cassava or growing yams. In a lot of places, cassava grows a lot better. It's better in dry climates and, and uh, it, you can harvest it all year round. So farmers, so farmers chose between these two options. That's bias transmission. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, and I mean, culture itself can also contribute to the creation of novel environments and evolutionary pressures, right? And there's where the culture part of gene culture coevolution also comes from. Of course. So, uh, I mean, the classic example is Lactose absorption, uh, uh, we're the only mammal that can digest the sugar in milk. That's because people culturally evolved um, the information necessary to keep cows, milk cows, drink milk, and so on. Uh, it seems to have happened several times independently. I think there are many, many other examples um, of gene culture coevolution. Uh, I think um, more speculatively, but more important, I think, is that I think um, my view is that cultural evolution has made possible larger scale human societies in the last 10 or 20,000 years. And that has selected, changed human psychology so that we're more um, uh, pro-social than other mammals. Uh, and uh, so, uh, in human society, people that are relentlessly selfish do badly. I mean, we know that sociopaths do extremely poorly in society. So, being a more pro-social person has benefits in a society where bad people, you know, end up in jail or or, or executed or something like that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And uh, when culture itself creates a new environment, should we look at, at culture as being culture or as being the envir environment? I mean, is this a, a distinction we should make when yeah. this is the case? Uh, I don't, uh, again, I don't care too much about what we call things, but... but um Environment is a is an umbrella term that, that includes all kinds of stuff. You know, the temperature, uh, what kinds of plants are available. You know, is steel are steel tools around, and um, and culture because it changes everything in humans uh, uh, leads to all kinds of changes in the environment. Some of them are purely cultural. So. Um, uh, you know, you grow up and you learn to speak Portuguese or you learn to speak English. Um, uh, others are products of cultural evolution that then change the environment. So the steel tools that uh, completely change tropical forest, the economics of tropical forest agriculture, you can't make steel tools without all the knowledge required to 
you know, mine iron ore and smelt steel and so on. But it's more like an environmental factor when the farmer's out there with his steel hoe or, or axe. The axe is the big thing. Clearing forest is much cheaper. So uh, um, uh, I think there's a kind of continuum between culture as purely a cultural phenomena, culture affecting the environment in important ways, and then um, uh, purely environmental things like, uh, you know, Climate change. Well, that's a cultural thing as well, I guess. A bit of gene culture coevolution. But uh, I mean, nowadays everything that humans do, we're culture saturated creatures. Everything is influenced by stuff we learn from others and from others. So it's very difficult to separate the environment from culturally evolved stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we already talked a little bit about some, uh, some parts some of, the of the cognitive apparatus, apparatus that, that we humans come uh, with, with uh, innately, innately. Uh, like, uh, the like the prestige bias, bias the frequency the dependent bias, bias that, that allows us to better understand, understand cultural, cultural, evolution. cultural evolution. But, but uh, are, there are there any other important, important innate, innate aspects, aspects of human of psychology, of psychology that we haven't, that we haven't yet talked yet about, about that you think you should, should be important, be important for, people for people to know to about, know about to, understand to understand how uh, the evolution of sure, the sure. works. I think there's a lot of I think I think there's a lot of just I think our psychology is predisposes us to learn some things rather than others, not because they're associated with prestige or, or something like that, but just because of what they are. So um, there's a woman at um, uh, she uh, named Annie Wirt. She works at the Max Planck uh, for Human Development in uh, in uh, Berlin, and uh, she's shown quite convincingly that little kids are much more prone to learn. Uh, they learn that vegetables are uh, toxic much more readily than um, meat. So, uh, and she's shown a very beautiful set of experiments to show that. Kids, Kids are, are very reluctant to put plants in their mouths until they see an adult put a plant in their mouth. They'll put all kinds of other stuff in their mouths. Uh, and uh, I've had two small kids. I've seen that happen. Uh, and uh, and so that's, that's what I call content bias. It's, it's an innate bias that makes sense, given the problems that people have. Namely, the plants are full of toxins, and, uh, and the kids should be. Uh, uh, Clark, Clark Barrett, Barrett uh, uh, an anthropologist at UCLA, has got another interesting um, example of the same kind. So he works in um, in eastern Ecuador with a group of people uh, called the Shuar, and uh, uh, he's shown that both kids in Los Angeles and Shuar kids are predisposed. So if you tell them facts about animals, and some of the facts are about which animals are good to eat. And other facts are about which animals are dangerous. Kids retain the danger information much more than the eating information. And so uh, that information transmits through chains and in schoolyards and stuff much more readily. And I think that's why, you know, dragons and all kinds of other mythical creatures are often quite frightening because set up to learn quickly, I have to worry about it. So that's a other content bias. I think there are many, many content biases of that kind. Biases of that kind. Uh, we're not, you know, we're not a blank slate at all. I don't think. And uh, um, and uh, those things shape cultural evolution. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so, uh, culture, as far as I understand, does, uh, isn't completely the result of innate individual psychological processes. But uh, it can only operate between the limits set by the way our brains process information, right? I mean, uh, something that, that we couldn't process co cognitively would never become culture, right? Right. So you can see that if you want a kind of, you know, simple example. Um, uh, do you ever do any computer programming? Mm -hmm. uh, so look at a binary number, like the binary number for 64, well, that's an easy one, for 56. And it's, 
it's just hard to process, right? Um, too many digits, they're all the same. Uh, uh, airport people count either by tens or fives or twenties, some, some bigger unit that lets you chunk numbers into, into um, more cognitively uh, handleable uh, bits. And uh, there's tons of stuff like that. I mean, um, uh, it's not just brains either. Uh, you know, nobody's going to um, um, write uh, on uh, with black ink on black paper because because our eyes can't pick up the, the difference between the paper and the ink. And so, you know, cultural evolution is constrained in many, many ways by the nature of human biology. I mean, there's just there's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, are there any set of uh, main features of culture that influence human evolution at the genetic level? I mean, what I mean by this is that, uh, for example, we have technology, we have examples of technology and how moral norms influence, influence and then, then create new environments, environments that, that influence, influence also, also genetic, genetic evolution. evolution. But, but uh, are, are, are there, there any, any particular aspects, aspects of culture that, that do so, so or, or because, because they, they all uh, operate in, in an interplay, interplay between, between themselves, themselves it's, it's very, very difficult, difficult to isolate them, them in terms of the ones, ones that influence uh, genetic, genetic evolution, evolution and, and, and the ones, ones which, which don't. don't. Yeah. I mean, I don't think, uh, I mean, some things are easy, like lactose absorption, right? You, you, you're not going to evolve the ability to digest milk sugar unless you're drinking fresh milk. So places like uh, India and Southwest Asia where people consume milk, a lot of it, but they make it into cheese or yogurt or something like that, there's been much less evolution. So there it's pretty easy. But, you know, moral norms and social behavior, that depends on a complex set of stuff. But I don't think we understand that well. Maybe someday we will, but right now I don't do it. It's, too, it's complicated and hard to understand. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, and I guess I would just make one last question that is about group selection. So would you say that uh, yes. we can apply group selection uh, for when studying cultural evolution or is uh, or are there any good reasons to apply it to biological uh, genetic evolution, let's say? Um, yeah, so part of this, I don't think there's, so the natural selection, so Darwin said there are three things necessary for natural selection. You have to have competition between entities, you have to have um, inheritance of, you have to have variation in, amongst those entities, and that variation has to be inherited. And so if you have variation among groups, and if that variation is transmitted, so the daughter groups resemble the parental groups, selection will act at that level. Now, selection will also act at, within groups, and they may sometimes conflict, they may sometimes not conflict. Um, the difference between cultural evolution and genetic evolution with regard to group selection, in my view, is that um, the Cultural evolution is much faster than genetic evolution. So um, that means that when there are norms or frequency dependent uh, bias, cultural evolution can maintain lots of variation among groups. And we know this is true, right? So in New Guinea, people that live 10 kilometers apart can speak languages that are completely unrelated. Um, and, you know, people in this valley, and it's, I mean, this is the stuff of anthropology, right? There is tons of small-scale cultural variation in smaller-scale societies, and I think quite a bit in larger-scale societies. It's just more complicated because it's between firms and schools and subunits of the societies. But anyway, I think group selection is less important in 
genetic evolution because the mechanism, because selection is much weaker, and so mixing processes like migration that tend to make groups all the same have um, a lot more role in in shaping uh, variation among groups. So think about baboon groups or chimpanzee groups in Africa. Um, two chimpanzee groups that live 10 kilometers apart are not going to be genetically very different. The reason they're not going to be genetically very different is because selection is not strong enough to keep the populations different given that females are moving back and forth between the groups. Human groups, I think it's also true, are genetically not very different on those spatial scales, but they can be extremely culturally different. So, you know, one group can be patrilineal, the next group can be matrilineal or whatever. And if those things affect the survival of groups or the rate at which they grow economically and are imitated by others or lots of things that affect which groups the values and the knowledge in which groups persist and which groups doesn't persist. Um, so I think that, that group selection is likely to be much more important in cultural evolution than in, in genetic evolution for that reason. And um, uh, now uh, there's no doubt that genetic that group selection, you can think of genetic group selection as having important effects, but other people conceptualize that as kin selection, and there's an argument about what to call things. But however you come down on that side, uh, you know, so the genetic people who study genetic evolution, there's quite a controversy about that. But uh, I don't think there's any doubt that whatever you think about that, that the cultural side of things. Uh, selection among groups is likely to be much more important because the mechanisms that generate and maintain variation among groups are much stronger than, than in genetic evolution. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Boyd, just before we finish, would you like to share with people perhaps some interesting piece of work you're doing at the moment? Perhaps, I don't know if you're working on a new book or not. Uh, and also where on the web people can follow your work. I don't know if you're active on social media or not. Yeah, uh, I'm uh, not active on social media. Um, I did try Twitter for a bit, but I found there was so much information flowing into my web, <laughs> into my browser, I couldn't keep up with it, so I turned it off. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I'm an old guy. But... Um, uh, I have a web page. Uh, you can find it, you know, Google Rob, Rob Boyd, and you'll find my web page. Um, uh, it has all my papers. Uh, you, most of the papers are downloadable. Um, I just finished a short book for a more general audience called A Different Kind of Animal. Uh, it's only about 100 pages long. It's meant to be kind of a primer for, for cultural evolution. Um, uh, it's available from Princeton University Press uh, and, of course, Amazon and everything else. Um, uh, currently, I'm working on on two projects. Um, uh, I have working with a student who, so I'm very interested in the extent to which people understand what they're, why they're imitating what they're imitating. So, um, so. Uh, the student is named Jake Harris. He's working in, in uh, doing field work in Tanzania with a hunter-gatherer group called the Hadza. And um, we're studying what, so kids learn how to make bows. They hunt with bows. They still make all their own bows. So it's a, very unusual nowadays, but, but uh, they don't use firearms. They use their own homemade bows. And they've been making bows for as far back as we can see. And the question is, why do they make the bows the way they do? Do they understand? Do they make bows because that's the Hadza way of making bows and they don't worry too much about it? Or do they make bows because they understand that the alternatives would be as good in some way? And so um, he's done quite a bit. We designed interviews and we've interviewed Hadza guys and work's not ready to be, I can't tell you what the answer is, but um, uh, I'm very interested because the nice thing about bows is they're simple. And we, we understand the physics quite well. So we know if we change the length of the bow, what happens to how far the arrow goes. We know what happens if we recurve the bow or make it a working handle. There are many other aspects of bows. 
And there's no doubt about what happens to the bow. And the question is, if we show a Hadza guy a bow that he makes and a bow that he doesn't make, can he tell us what the effect of the difference is on the performance of the bow? So that's one project. Uh, the other project is um, I'm interested in how um, third-party monitoring. So one of the things about norms in human society is, is that people, um, you know, they depend on people watching each other and, and, and uh, punishing people who deviate or rewarding people who behave properly. And um, uh, so uh, um, and I'm interested in how that relates to um, reciprocity in human society. So uh, the theory of reciprocity doesn't take much account of third party monitoring, you know, Trevor's and, and Axelrod and Hamilton and so on, uh, Martin Novak. And it predicts that reciprocity ought to be quite common in nature. The conditions for reciprocity to evolve are quite relaxed. But there is hardly any reciprocity in nature other than in humans. Uh, some in primates, uh, maybe a little in other species, but human life, you know, hunter gatherers, they live in a world completely dominated by trade, exchange, mutual aid. Chimpanzee breaks its leg, he or she's on her own. Uh, he, or his or her own, a human breaks his leg and somebody will feed that person in almost every human society. And uh, that kind of recipro rec reciprocation, um, so I'm working on a theoretical project and then an empirical project, uh, and my hypothesis is that third party monitoring makes that kind of reciprocity much easier to evolve when uh, there are lots of misunderstandings. So I think the problem with the existing theory is that it assumes that everybody knows for sure who cooperated and who didn't. And I think in real life, we're never completely sure of anything. And uh, and if you modify the theory to to allow for high rates of error, so very often somebody thinks they cooperated and other people think they didn't, um, uh, then the conditions for reciprocity evolve get quite difficult. But if you add third third party monitoring, it can make it easy again. So that's. A hypothesis at this point, and we've made some models, and we've been doing some lab experiments. Mm -hmm. okay, so those are my great. projects. <laughs> okay, great, Dr. White. I think it okay, was... Okay, uh, Carlo, thank you very much. Is, is, sorry, sorry, could you repeat it, please? I, I didn't catch it. I just said, Ricardo, thanks very much. Oh, okay, okay. Nice to, yeah. nice to talk to you. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I was going to say that it was a very good conversation, and... I would like to thank you again for coming, for taking a little bit of your time to come on the podcast. My pleasure. Okay. If you appreciate my work, please consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash the dissenter. Thank you.